Okay, uh, hi everyone, it's my great honor to introduce Professor Steve Dorfman as today's local speaker. Uh, Steve is the Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Yale. Uh, most of you are probably wondering who I am. Steve, on the other hand, needs no introduction. Um, he has a long list of decorations and awards, uh, which I won't even attempt to cover in full. Among these, he's an elected fellow of the American Physical Society, a member of the National Academy of Sciences. He's made foundational contributions to many, many areas of condensed matter physics, for which he was awarded the uh, Buckley Prize for fundamental experimental and theoretical research on correlated many electron states in low dimensional systems. Um, more recently, his interests have turned towards quantum science and engineering, where he spearheaded the uh, Yale Quantum Institute, and uh, we're very happy that you have him here today to tell us about some of his work in using superconducting circuit elements for quantum information. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and see uh, many uh, friends. Enjoy the fine weather. Uh, the earthquake was just before I landed on the plane, so I didn't feel it. Um, good, so um, I'm a uh, condensed matter physicist who is trying to pretend to be an atomic physicist. I'm going to tell you about um, things that can be done in, not in cavity quantum electrodynamics, but circuit quantum electrodynamics. And the people that do the hard part, the experiments are over here. and. Uh, any theory collaborators here. So please uh, feel free to ask questions if I uh, uh, go through something uh, that's not clear. So uh, just to remind you that quantum electrodynamics is the study of quantized electromagnetic fields interacting with electrons and atoms. And uh, it's the fact that the zero-point fluctuations of the electric field, mostly the electric field in the vacuum, can do things like destabilize the 2p orbital of uh, hydrogen and cause the irreversible spontaneous decay of the hydrogen atom from 2p to 1s, emitting an ultraviolet photon in a time of about 1.6 nanoseconds. Uh, there are also, uh, of course, uh, this Feynman diagram represents some virtual emission of a photon by the electron and, and reabsorption. And those effects, you know, we normalize the mass. They uh, break the uh, degeneracy between the 2s and the 2p states of the electron orbitals in hydrogen uh, through the land shift. And there are many other interesting effects. And cavity QED is trying to engineer and change some of those effects by, instead of having uh, uh, photons in free space, you engineer the density of states for photons by putting them in a box or between two highly reflecting mirrors. As is done, let's say, in optics, you'll have a two highly reflecting mirrors separated by a few centimeters. And you'll drop atoms through there, or these days you can trap atoms in there. And uh, they can uh, interact with uh, photons that are bouncing back and forth between the mirrors that have some particular frequencies, or maybe discrete frequencies, separated by the free spectral range. And, uh, but the cavities are wide open, and the atoms can still mostly spontaneously decay at the same rate as in uh, free space. We're going to be talking about uh, not mirrors, but superconducting boxes made of aluminum that completely surround uh, the space where the uh, artificial atoms and the microwave photons are living. And one interesting thing is that you can, if you uh, in this case, where the, it's not possible for the atom that's sitting in there to see any free space, it's completely surrounded by mirrors, if you arrange the geometry of the box so that there are no electromagnetic modes at the frequency 
of the transition of the atom, it's impossible for the atom to uh, spontaneously emit a photon. It can virtually emit and reabsorb. And as a result, our superconducting qubits have their lifetime enhanced by a factor of a thousand when you put them inside a box like this, which we have to do uh, in order to get long uh, coherence times. So uh, microwave uh, cavity QEDs done, of course, by the Hiroche group in Paris with uh, uh, beams of circular Rydberg atoms, not, uh, not under individual control, but just coming out of an oven, passing through the uh, cavity and having a small microwave drive on the cavity. And you can observe changes in the state of the Rydberg atoms transitioning from between 50 and 51, uh, 50th and 51st principal quantum number in the orbit, uh, depending on how long they stay inside the cavity. And uh, so this is, uh, of course, the subject of a Nobel Prize, and, uh, and it's reviewed here. Uh, then there's optical cavity QED, as I mentioned, uh, in which you maybe drop atoms through there or store them, and instead of measuring the state of the atoms, you measure the state of the photons that uh, are passing through and have interacted with the atoms. So in circuit QED, we're going to talk about microwave photons. Uh, inside superconducting circuits, it may be three-dimensional cavities, it may be one-dimensional coplanar waveguided resonator, uh, two uh, resonators, and we're not going to we're going to use atoms um, with uh, atomic number uh, ten to the twelve or so, uh, making a, a big pile of uh, aluminum, and uh, make make uh, Joseph junction circuits that act like. Uh, qubits or artificial atoms. And uh, these atoms are big and they have very strong interactions with the microwave photons, which are confined into extremely small uh, cavities, so they're never far from the atoms and they get to interact frequently. And the coupling is so strong that you can do nonlinear uh, quantum optics sort of at the one and two photon level. And uh, we can achieve much stronger nonlinearities than you can in typical quantum optics setups. So here's a hydrogen atom, not to scale, uh, about this big. Uh, here's some sort of electrical circuit element, about a, a seven orders of magnitude larger in size. Um, the transition frequency for hydrogen is 2.46 petahertz. The lifetime of the excited state, as I said, is 1.6 nanoseconds. The Q divided by 2 pi is the product of those two numbers is about 4 million. And the transition dipole moment between 1s and 2p is of order 1 to pi. Maybe it's even defined to be a to pi, I've forgotten. Uh, and uh, over here, the frequency is about 7 gigahertz. It's in the microwave. The, um, the uh, lifetime is about 300 microseconds. The Q is about 2 million, and the transition dipole is 30 million to pi. Okay? This is what we live on. There's this uh, several pair, Cooper pairs of electrons moving a millimeter is the sort of zero point fluctuations of the charge across the size of our atom. That produces tremendous strong uh, coupling to the microwave photons and lets us do things that we hope make the atomic physicist jealous. So, uh, so you can make integrated circuits out of these things, evaporating aluminum, uh, and putting Josephson junctions, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, you can, uh, you know, it's great that all cesium atoms are indistinguishable, and that's helpful for making atomic clocks that are the same everywhere in the world. Uh, but uh, one advantage of artificial atoms is if you don't like the dipole moment, you can just make it bigger. <laughs> so the, uh, the transistor of this quantum computing, this qubit, is the Josephson junction. It's just uh, two pieces of aluminum separated by a naturally formed nanometer thick uh, aluminum oxide tongue barrier. And uh, it, this uh, Josephson junction acts like a kind of nonlinear inductor 
in an LC circuit in which the inductance varies with how much current is flowing. And uh, this prevents this circuit from being a harmonic oscillator where all the levels will be evenly spaced, gives it some spectrum more like an atom with uneven spacing, and allows us to, to make, uh, uh, have control over it. So uh, in one way of looking at this, the coordinate of this oscillator is the superconducting order parameter phase difference across the two junctions, across the junction. And so there's a cosine uh, of the phase that forms the potential. And at the bottom, it looks like a parabola, but it's softer than that. And so you get some weak negative anharmonicity, where the uh, 0 to 1 transition might be at 7 gigahertz, and the 1 to 2 might be at 6.9 gigahertz, 100 megahertz lower. Uh, so the atom has about 10 to the 12 mobile electrons in this aluminum film evaporated on a sapphire substrate connected by this nonlinear inductor. This thing looks like a, an antenna, about a millimeter long, and the natural excitations of this atom are the Cooper pairs sloshing back and forth uh, making uh, in the dipole uh, antenna. The super, if you had 10 to the 12 electrons, you'd normally think, well, if I had a molecule with 10 to the 12 electrons, you'd think, wow, it's going to be a spaghetti of spectral lines. But uh, the superconductivity gaps out almost all of the Fermi gas excitations, leaving only collective motion of the Cooper pairs across there. Furthermore, the long range repulsive Coulomb force makes it kind of a uniform sloshing. There's no acoustic. Uh, uh, collective modes there. The quantized entry level spectrum of this atom is simpler than hydrogen. There's no fine structure and hyperfine structure. It's just an anharmonic oscillator. And the quality factor, as I showed you before, is about the same as, as hydrogen 1s to 2p. And, uh, but it's this enormous transition dipole moment because the atom comes with its own antenna that uh, lets us do uh, these strong coupling. So this is what we mean by circuit QED. OK, so uh, I just want to uh, kind of talk through some of the things you can do because of this very strong coupling. So here's, uh, here's a box. Here's the uh, fundamental uh, half wavelength uh, resonance of the electric field. The red lines indicate the polarization and the amplitude of the electric field. I can think of the strength of the electric field here at the position of the atom as the coordinate of a harmonic oscillator for that particular mode. And uh, of course, it's a dipole coupling. So the atom, the artificial atom, can emit a photon into the cavity uh, and then reabsorb it, uh, exchanging energy back and forth. And provided that the cavity resonance is at a different frequency than the qubit 0 to 1 transition, then you can't, the atom can't permanently emit energy into the cavity. It can only have second order virtual exchange effects, uh, level repulsions. And the net result of that is this in the, what's called the dispersive limit, where the cavity and the qubit have different frequencies, this very simple Hamiltonian. So there's a single harmonic oscillator corresponding to this particular mode. It's such a small cavity that the next mode is roughly twice as high in frequency, and we can ignore it. Uh, so there's a harmonic oscillator, that, and the energy is just uh, Planck's constant times the frequency times the number of photons. And then I'm going to approximate this anharmonic oscillator as a two-level atom. If the anharmonic is big enough, I can mostly do that. When we do real calculations, uh, I keep the higher levels. But this is an OK approximation, so I'm going to approximate it as a spin a half, a fake spin a half. Spin down is uh, artificial atom in the ground state, spin up is in the first excited state. And the anharmonicity makes the next transition uh, off resonance and not too important. But then the virtual effects, second order effects of the dipole coupling, produces this dispersive Hamiltonian. 
which is a coupling between sigma z, whether or not the qubits in ground or center state, and the number of photons in the cavity, and there's some dispersive coupling chi. And because the transition dipole moment is so big, this chi is uh, gigantic. It's about 3,000 line widths of the atom of the cavity. That's very helpful. <laughs> so uh, let's think about this. Uh, there are two ways to interpret this Hamiltonian. The first way is to say, oh, I noticed that the coefficient of A dagger A, which I identify as the frequency of the cavity, depends on the state of the qubit. It's as if the qubit is a little piece of dielectric that you drop into the cavity, and when it's in the ground state, it has, uh, let's say, a uh, positive contribution to the index of refraction, and when it's in the excited state, it has a negative contribution, and it changes the cavity frequency, the resonance frequency. Okay? And so here you see the spectrum of the cavity will have this frequency peak omega uh, minus chi if the qubit is down and omega plus chi if the qubit is up. Okay? And they're separated by 3,000 lines. If the qubit is in a superposition of up and down, then the cavity is in a superposition of two different resonance frequencies except are different by 3,000 lines. That should bother you somehow. Uh, of course, if a single stray photon comes from the environment and measures the frequency, it's going to collapse. Uh, but suppose that I um, suppose that I send in a classical uh, 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 signal and I measure what is the frequency of the cavity. I can bounce microwaves off it, and if I get uh, if I'm on resonance, I'll get a pi phase shift. If I'm off resonance, I'll get 0 or 2 pi. I can measure the frequency, and that then immediately tells me the state of the qubit. So I can use this to make a uh, quantum non-demolition measurement of the state of the qubit. Quantum non-demolition meaning if it's in a superposition, yes, it's going to collapse randomly, but if I keep measuring it, I'll get the same answer after that. So. Uh, so I can use this to turn the Hamiltonian to measure the state of my atom. I can also apply different one drive at this frequency and one drive at this frequency, and maybe have them have different uh, uh, amplitudes or phases and displace. So if I'm on resonance, I will displace the cavity in phase space in some direction. And possibly the other tone has a different phase. I'm going to displace uh, the cavity in another direction. And now the state of the cavity is entangled with the state of the qubit. If the spin is down, I might be over here. And if the spin is up, I might be over there. So that's a Schrodinger cat. Uh, cat is uh, dead, and the uh, air is full of poisonous negative amplitude uh, electric field, and the cat is alive, and, and uh, it only has positive reinforcing electric field natural uh, speed, which is very good. And then, through some other tricks that I'll skip over, I can actually flip, I can disentangle the qubit with the cavity and produce just a superposition of an oscillator that's either here or here. So there are two oscillations 180 degrees out of phase with each other. Uh, in coherent superposition, and in the language of the field, that's not a Schrodinger cat, but a Schrodinger cat state, just to distinguish that the, uh, the cat is no longer in with that guy. Okay, so that was the interpretation of this term, is that the frequency of the cavity depends on the state of the qubit. Now I'm going to take the very same term and say, no, no, it's not the coefficient of A dagger A that depends on sigma Z, it's the coefficient of sigma Z that depends on A dagger A. And then I say, oh, but that means that the frequency of transition of the qubit depends on how many photons are in the cavity. It's the same term, but a completely different interpretation. And uh, so there's a light shift of, of 2 chi every time I add a photon to the cavity. So,
Here is the spectrum of the qubit, not the cavity. And uh, depend the frequency will be here, or here, or here, depending on how many photons are in the cavity. So if I apply a tone at this frequency and try, uh, try to make a pi pulse to flip the qubit from the ground of the excitostate, if it flips, then I know there's exactly one photon in the cavity. If it doesn't flip, I have to erase that amplitude from the photon state and get some weird, you know, like a coherent state missing amplitude for one, for example. Some weird things that happen there. And uh, this is a way of counting photons. And it's a kind of photomultiplier, but it's much, well, A, it works for microwaves, which is good. B, it's better than a photomultiplier because it doesn't absorb the photon when you detect it. It's quantum non-demolition. I can keep flipping the qubit, and uh, if it only flips at this frequency, I know the photon is still there. So I can use this to beat and to raise the quantum efficiency and beat the dark cap down to effectively zero uh, by uh, uh, majority voting. And uh, uh, that turns out to have some interesting uses. So here is, so that was, there's the schematic. Here is what actual data looks like from, uh, this is, I should get better data. This is sort of ancient, but uh, it was the first one. So uh, here you see uh, some noisy uh, uh, spectrum of the qubit. And uh, there was a coherent state in the cavity, which has an uncertain photon number. And then there's a long time average, so you, you get all the different possibilities. Sometimes there's zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight photons in the cavity. And you see a nice Poisson distribution because it's a, what it's supposed to be for a uh, coherent state. And uh, so uh, I told you that these lines were split by a factor of 3,000 lines. It doesn't look like it here. That's because the grad students were lazy did the experiment in a hurry and power brought the lines by a factor of 100. I, I need to go in there and do it myself. <laughs> I didn't go into the lab one day. I thought I was going to like, they're going to let me turn knobs and everything, but I was just editing Python scripts and hitting run. It wasn't that satisfying. <laughs> uh, so what do we learn from this? Microwaves, despite their name, are particles. They're perfectly fine quanta, just as good as the visible light ones that have enough energy to do the rhodopsin isomerization transition in your eyeballs. Uh, they have uh, 10,000 times uh, less energy, but they're still particles. And uh, this way of uh, counting them, which is a kind of square law detector, and as I said, doesn't eat up the photons, is actually not subject to vacuum noise. And so this makes a great way to think about measuring, uh, looking for axion dark matter, which, if it exists, turns into microwave photons in the presence of a magnetic field. And so uh, there are experiments uh, actually uh, underway at Yale and other places uh, uh, here, including uh, thinking about these things. In this particular experiment is using um, uh, not exactly the same idea, but related circuit QED ideas with two-mode squeezing to uh, detect the axions without amplifying the vacuum noise, roughly speaking. Okay, so you can, you can count and measure the photons, but you can also do this uh, analogous trick that I talked about before. Suppose you apply different tones at various of these frequencies with different phases and amplitudes, then you can uh, do strange things to quantum state engineering. So for example, suppose that I have a state that's made up of different uh, Fox states, different photon numbers, and I want to apply a particular phase, theta n, that's different for each state, each n. I can do that by applying a tone here which, if there is one photon in the state, I will uh, take the qubit and just you know, move it around the black sphere a little bit and have it pick up some very phase, which I can control and put there. So I can, I can kind of sculpt the wave function in some complicated way 
by uh, and in parallel on all these different lines. So this is a selective number, selective uh, something phase gauge snap gate, and uh, is extremely useful for controlling the state of this system. Um, so. The summary then of the control capabilities are with this one term, I can do cavity displacement. I can drive the cavity on resonance in two different ways, conditioned on the qubit state to make, for example, cats. And over here, I can do qubit rotations conditioned on how many photons are in the cavity. And between those two, you can prove that you have universal control of the whole quantum system. So you can basically start with vacuum and qubit in the ground state and make, uh, in, at least in theory, anything, any state at all. OK, so here's an example, in, uh, not in theory, but in experiment. So here's uh, a. Uh, Reentrant cavity, there's a little uh, quarter wavelength post in the center of this, uh, so it looks like a coaxial cable here and like a waveguide behind cut off up here. So there's no currents flowing around when you put the lid on the thing. Uh, there's a drive port on the cavity. There's uh, one of these transmon qubits. There's a little coplanar waveguide resonator to read out the qubit, and then there's another drive port. And so you can put a drive uh, on the ancilla, on the transmon, both the uh, uh, cosine omega t and sine omega t quadratures, and you can put another drive, uh, two quadratures, uh, directly on the cavity, and then you just try some random pulse, and you uh, see how it does. Actually, you, you, you do this all in the simulation first, and then you just plug in this random looking pulse, and uh, as you go along, you can measure how many photons, the photon number distribution in the cavity, and it kind of goes up and does all kinds of crazy things, and then splits, and then boom, all turns to n equals 6. And you can compute that pulse sequence in advance, because we, we, we can predict the Hamiltonian parameters to about 1%, and uh, just tweak them up a little bit by measurement, and then once we have those, we can predict uh, and find this numerically optimized pulse shape. And then you can do state tomography. You can measure the Wigner function of the cavity. The Wigner function is a kind, it's related to the density matrix. It's a kind of partial Fourier transform of the density matrix. You can think of it as this axis is the coordinate of the oscillator, this axis is the momentum of the oscillator, and the color is not the like the phase space distribution for the Boltzmann function or something. It's a, it's a kind of quasi-probability amplitude. It can be positive and negative. And you can see this one looks like a, a bullseye because um, the number is exactly 6, and the phase of the oscillation is completely uncertain. So that's why it has that circular symmetry. So I won't go into the details of how we measure that uh, Wigner function, but the key enabling technology is that we can measure the photon number parity without measuring the photon number. Okay, so here's another example of Wigner function of a cat state. I told you how we made those cat states. So it's a superposition of a coherent state with amplitude alpha, so it's over here in phase space. And uh, minus alpha is over here in phase space. Uh, this is data. Uh, there's minus alpha, plus alpha. There you see it's not a point, it's a fuzzy blob. That's because position and momentum don't commute. So you're right before your eyes is vacuum noise. Okay? Later we're going to make squeeze states where, the, where that blob is squished, squeezed. Uh, these rapid parity oscillations in the middle are sort of the fringes of the, the whiskers of the cat, and they uh, tell you that this is not a mixture of alpha and minus alpha, but a coherent superposition. And the fact that the center fringe is red, the same color as these guys, means that's a plus sign, not a minus sign. 
if I had a mixture of plus and minus signs, then the fringes would wash out and I would see just uh, uh, nothing there. But these would still be there. OK. Uh, so you could use this for quantum sensing. If you were interested in sensing very small electric field you know, displacements of your oscillator in one particular direction, uh, much smaller than the zero point uncertainty in the position, then here's a way of uh, measuring that modulo this distance, uh, uh, sensing it uh, very, rap uh, very sensitively. Okay. Well, you can make three-leg cats. You can make uh, four-leg cats where the fringes have fringes. See, it's a, it's a Zurich compass state, it's called. So now you're sensitive to displacements in both directions. Uh, you can make very large cats. So the distance between these guys uh, squared corresponds to some photon number. And you can make here, they stopped at 111 photons at the time perhaps the most macroscopic superposition ever produced. My friend Jonathan Holm can now make those in mechanical oscillations and ion traps about the same size. Uh, and this loss of contrast is mostly due to our ability to, uh, inability to measure the parity fast enough. Uh, the, the, there's no evidence that the cat is becoming uh, incoherent. Although, of course, for bigger cats, they lose photons faster so they jump parity more frequently, and that's why eventually they, they're sort of perfect examples of how you cross over from quantum to classical. Okay, uh, well, just for icing on the cake, here is a result from an experiment from Michel Deveray's group just posted recently uh, on the archive, uh, in which he's made Gottesman Katai Presto, GKP, uh, states for, that are useful for quantum error correction. 20 years ago when they were invented, they've seen the uh, sort of silly theorists' pipe dreams. Uh, they were designed for the wrong kind of errors. Uh, we recently checked that they were great for photon loss, despite the fact that they weren't designed for that. And they also seemed like it'd be impossible to make. But with uh, this strong coupling and some new ideas, uh, people have been able to make these grid states. So they're basically, their wave function is a picket fence of uh, sharply defined positions on a regular lattice. And in the Fourier transform of that is also a picket fence. So in phase space, you get these grids. And uh, you see phase changes in every other row, blue, red, blue, red, 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 red. Uh, this is an, um, in the, in the, there are two different such uh, states separated, the picket fence is uh, intermeshed like this. You can think of that as a superposition of that as a qubit. When it's pointing in the x direction, this is what it looks like. When it's pointing in the y direction, it looks like this. For those that are experts, there's a thing called a magic state that you want to inject into these kind of memories. Uh, there it is. These, this is for a square lattice in phase space. This is for a triangular lattice in phase space. So you can see there's this um, ability to, to uh, sculpt and create all kinds of interesting, engineer all kinds of interesting quantum states. This can be used for quantum error correction and has, <coughs> on basically the first try, come quite close to the so-called break-even point where it starts making the lifetime of the information longer. Are you going to explain the quantum error correction? Uh, so, um, I have a 30 slides at the end, which I'm unlikely to get to. Uh, so, the short, the honest answer is no, but I'm happy to talk to you. <laughs> uh, I have, a, I, you know, I've been giving this talk on the error correction many, many times, and I stupidly decided I would do something uh, new uh, this time, so it's uh, uh, mostly not in there. Okay, so what can we do with these control uh, capabilities? Well, uh, it turns out it's extremely advantageous to do quantum error correction by putting your information into these interesting uh, bosonic code words inside these cavity superpositions of different Fox states. And uh, the cavities are very long lived. They have an extremely simple error model. All they do is lose photons, point, 
Uh, if you have, if you try to do the same error correction with, uh, let's say, nine physical qubits to make a logical qubit, then there are three different kinds of errors that can occur in each of nine places, and you have to, your Maxwell Beeman has to keep track of that. It's much harder than uh, doing it for a single mode oscillator where there's only basically one kind of error. Uh, there's another thing I'm, I'm going to tell you about. Uh, you, you, can, you can think of optical spectra uh, the, of uh, the vibrational sidebands of, uh, of an optical spectrum of a molecule as a boson sampling problem. Uh, and then maybe for the future, we're fantasizing that perhaps we could make a bigger two-dimensional array of oscillators. Uh, we know how to make uh, beam footers between them with produce definite phases. So you, when the photons go around the loop, you, they can think that they are in a gauge field. You think they have charge in a magnetic field. We can also make the bosons interact. So maybe we can make uh, fractional quantum Hall effect for bosons, uh, in this case, microwave photons. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you uh, uh, a little bit about uh, molecular vibrations. Uh, so the idea behind this is that uh, you have a, some kind of molecule, a photon is absorbed, it moves an electron from bonding to antibonding. The nuclei want to move to a new equilibrium position, they're moving on a new potential energy surface, and the molecule begins to vibrate. Uh, classically, you just see a ringing like this, quantum mechanically you see um, uh, vibrational sidebands in the optical spectrum. And uh, those, those phonons, those mechanical vibrations, are bosons, harmonic oscillators, or anharmonic oscillators. We have oscillators. It should be more efficient to simulate bosons with bosons than to, to map the Hilbert space of the bosons onto a bunch of two-level systems and do very complicated gates to represent something simple like the operator x, which is just a plus a dagger, for example. So, uh, so we're going to try to look at uh, uh, triatomic molecules that undergo a certain symmetry of vibration, so they have two degrees of freedom, and we're going to uh, s do a quantum simulation using two microwave oscillators. And by various tricks of going into rotating frames and things, it doesn't matter that these frequencies are completely different than those frequencies. And so forth. Okay, so uh, so here's the idea: you have some, uh, you have two two coordinates, q1 and q2, and so you have a, a two-dimensional potential energy surface. The, when the electrons are in their ground state, the potential energy surface has some shape. When in the uh, optically excited state, there's a different potential energy surface. And uh, you're going to start in uh, one definite Fox state, let's say zero vibrations in each mode, or one in the first mode and two in the second mode. You're going to go up, you're not going to be in an eigenstate of this surface, you're going to be in a superposition. That will give you an optical spectrum with various sidebands. And uh, you want to know uh, what is the probability that I end up with different strength uh, in each sideband. So it turns out that this is in the complexity class of what's called boson sampling. You have, um, imagine I have a bunch of ports to put in photons and a bunch of beam splitters that mix the uh, you know, cause superpositions of all those modes. If I put in coherent states, like from a laser with definite amplitude and phase, it's a trivial calculation to work through what the beam splitters do and figure out what the amplitude and phase of the coherent states is the output. But it turns out, if you want to know, if I put in a Fox state, and you know, there's zero photons in this port, one in this, two in that, and I want to know what the probability distribution is for numbers of photons at the output, that's a computationally uh, hard problem, and uh, it it's hard because it requires calculation of a permanent a ma of a matrix of the, the propagator matrix. And um, 
So, okay, there's only two modes here. It's actually not that hard to calculate on the, uh, uh, with the Gaussian <laughs> commercial package, but uh, it's a start. And so what is, what is uh, we're going to make one approximation here in our first experiment that both of these are harmonic, but there's going to be squeezing. The spring constant is going to change between the two modes. And also, the two modes will, the potentially surface will rotate. There'll be a, a mixture, the, the, the symmetry axes will, in the space here will be different. And uh, so we're going to encode all of that information. The chemists have figured out how to do that for us with something called a Doktorov transformation, uh, which involves uh, squeezing the first mode, squeezing the second mode, that is cha changing the spring constant, uh, doing a beam splitter that couples them, unsqueezing, unsqueezing, and then displacing each one. Okay, so those are very natural operations when you have uh, optical uh, microwave modes, at least. Uh, there are people trying to do this in the optical, but the squeezing is difficult. Uh, and uh, so this is all mapped onto some set of operations that I've uh, using this universal control that we have. And um, here's the result. So here is uh, photo ionization of water into a particular symmetry state. And here is, uh, what is that, ozone? Uh, and you see uh, the black curve is the sort of exact calculation for our model Hamiltonian and you see two different ways of measuring uh, uh, the uh, probability of getting different numbers of photons. So the two, the two phonons have different frequencies. So you can get three of this and four of that or five of this and seven of that and then they add up to producing different uh, mechanical vibration sidebands. You can tell it's a chemistry paper because it's in inverse centimeters. And um, so each, the position of each line is determined by two integers. How many of uh, mode one quanta are there and how many of mode two? So I showed you before we can count quanta. In this case, it's how many microwave photons are in each of the two cavities. We can count them by, by trying to flip the, uh, an ancilla qubit at this frequency that would say that corresponds to a light shift with so many photons in the cap. You could say, are there two? Are there three? Are there four? Are there five? Uh, when you have a lot of lines, that's not very efficient, uh, but it does work. And that is the purple dots. And then, um, uh, what you really like to do is uh, boson sampling. You'd really like to get do one shot of the experiment and then have the analog of a number resolving photomultiplier, photo detector that tells you there were seven in this, in this mode and four in that mode in one shot. And we're able to do that because we can make these uh, Q and D measurements and use what's basically phase estimation to uh, ask the question uh, to find uh, in one shot uh, the binary uh, representation of the number of phonons in each mode. We can, we can find the number of, uh, uh, in this case, photons, uh, mod 2, mod 4, mod 8, mod 6. And so that's true sampling. It's like having a number resolving counter uh, that works up to four bits. And for each of uh, two modes, and that's the red, uh, the red sampling. And they, they, uh, you can see there are uh, differences between them. Uh, it's a little bit less accurate, but it's, if you have exponentially many lines, uh, this costs you only y of that big number, so it's much, uh, much more uh, efficient, which is why we wanted to uh, demonstrate it. But for, you know, for a first experiment, uh, it worked, uh, worked moderately well. So it's described in this, uh, in this preprint here. <coughs>
Um, so uh, using bosons, in this case microwave photons, to simulate bosons, in this case mechanical vibrations, is very efficient. I mean, that looked like a sort of complicated circuit, but it was just squeezing and beam splitters and displacements, all of which are relatively easy for us to do. If you took the same dimension of Hilbert space, uh, you would have needed about 8 qubits and about 1,000 gates. Uh, and something which uh, no uh, discrete variable quantum computer is capable of uh, doing uh, these days. So it's not uh, quantum supremacy compared to my uh, uh, high performance classical computing cluster, but it's uh, supremacy over uh, Google and IBM. <laughs> so, uh, so I think there's a lot of fundamental physics to do, and this circuit QED architecture uh, may be uh, a good way to go for trying to build a scalable quantum computer. And uh, we're sort of working our way up the, uh, this uh, stairway. And uh, uh, I didn't uh, really talk about it, but we've reached the point where in, uh, and this is really the only technology in which quantum error correction has been performed that actually made the lifetime of the information longer that has exceeded this break-even point. And there are now one experiment that's succeeded it slightly and two experiments that have come within 10% of, of uh, reach 90% of uh, break-even. And in discrete variable two-level qubit systems, um, uh, it's just extremely uh, difficult because, as I said, you have a large number of uh, physical qubits to represent a logical qubit. That means you have a large number of errors that can happen, and they can happen faster. And uh, so the first thing that every logical qubit does is make the error rate worse, and then you have to turn on the error correction and your Maxwell demon has to overcome that, uh, that factor, and, and uh, no one has done it except with these uh, bosonic techniques. So I think I will uh, stop there, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>
And so, uh, so that requires figuring out how to you know, deal with fermions. And um, uh, yeah, we don't know how to do that yet. Oh, I, I may have missed it, but uh, what temperature were your artificial atoms? Uh, 20 millikelvin. Okay. So the number to know is 21 gigahertz multiplied by Planck's constant is equal to Boltzmann's constant times 1 kelvin. So um, a 5 gigahertz qubit has a transition energy of a quarter of a kelvin. You need to be way below that if you want to be mostly in the grass state. So 20 millikelvin is Conveniently available with a dry fridge and you push a button. The provost has to pay uh, $30,000 a year in electricity and the PI doesn't have to buy helium. Then you get a question. Oh. Oh. Um, yeah, just the question about your this um, argument about whether it's better to have one bosonic mode versus nine. Yeah. So, I mean, the higher levels of that oscillator are decaying as fast as some superposition of um, states in the nine qubit. Faster, actually. Right. Um, so, I think if I, so you could ask the following question. Suppose I had um, uh, ten, uh, ten two-level systems. Oops. The wrong thing. Ten, 10 qubits, okay? So, uh, two to the 10 uh, states in the Hilbert space. And uh, the fastest they could decay would be if they're all excited, it's 10 times faster than one, right? If I had that many states, if I made the mistake of putting that many states in one oscillator, the top state decays 1,023 times faster than, than the bottom state. It, it requires exponentially high energy. Okay? So uh, if I had uh, undamped oscillators and complete control over this exponentially large thing, I could try to do that, but that's a mistake. But if I have 10, uh, 10 qubits, each of which can have uh, x, y, or z error, and even if my code, let's say, uh, can only protect against one error, there are 10 places it can happen, which I have to identify in order to correct the error. So I have to make many, many very high weight error syndrome measurements to locate the error and then fix it. So I don't need 2 to the 10 levels here to to make an error correcting code. There's actually only one error, photon loss. And for example, my um, if you know what a code stabilizer is, I can just use uh, the parity. Every time the parity jumps, I know there was an error. And uh, so there's only one error and one thing to measure to see it happen. So as long as my code words uh, So some, some, uh, yeah. I have some superposition of Fox states that's my logical zero, and some superposition of Fox states that's logical one. If they both have even parity, then I can, they're stabilized by this. And uh, if they have the same mean photon number, it uh, turns out you can do the error correction. So in the end, let's say, suppose I, suppose I make a, let's make a head-to-head -head comparison. I want to take a code which protects me against amplitude damping, photon loss. I do that with qubits. The minimum number I need is four. And uh, so that's uh, Hilbert space dimension of uh, 16. And over here, I can make a code that just uses two words. Zero plus four photons or two photons. So I only use five states. So log base two of uh, five is a lot fewer than uh, four qubits. So I don't need nearly as many states. And uh, that's why this works. I don't try to go 
not that interesting. I, but you put your finger on an important. Uh, but, but is this the kind of correction that these that these hexagonal and square codes do? Uh, correcting different kinds. Right. Of so that code, the, the GKP code, was designed, as I said, by theorists uh, to just correct displacement errors. Well, that, you know that's just not what happens. It's photon loss. Well, technically. Anything is a superposition of displacements. It's an overcomplete set. But the mapping to a photon loss is kind of singular. Uh, and no one had ever checked the code for <coughs> realistic errors. It turns out, under a wide range of conditions, it's actually amazingly good. Even though both were designed for the yeah. So, this, this <coughs> kind of so let, me, let me explain why it, it, uh, you can. We don't know what the optimal recovery channel is for the GKP code, but I can tell you a very good channel. So as damping occurs, the whole thing kind of contracts in phase space. So let's take an amplifier, a, a phase insensitive amplifier, and just expand everything back. If it's a perfect quantum limited amplifier, it will expand everything back and then add half a quantum of noise. And it's displaced the noise. So that recovery channel maps loss onto displacement. That's not optimal, it turns out. And we don't, we don't know what the optimal one is. But that gives you a hint about why this, this may be, this is a direction we're very excited about. Now, now that people can actually make these things. But the break even, you said that you reached break even yeah. just for the area. So that's that kind with that kind of. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, um, it came close with that. This code with the zero and four and two photons reaches 90% of break-even. The one that's actually uh, slightly exceeded break-even is, uh, ironically, uses Schrodinger cats to store the state information. So an even parity, this kind of cat, is one word, even parity, that cat, so displaced the position or displaced the momentum, are the two code words. And it's ironic because cats are the the poster child for things that uh, decohere rapidly. But uh, so not very big, and the Q of uh, <coughs> cavity is uh, 100 million. Uh, you actually, and because the error model is so simple, uh, you can, uh, you gain. And so far, that's the only code that's actually beaten very deep in any technology. Can, can you say a little bit about how those BKB states are made? Uh, yes, so I showed you that you could make conditional displacements of the cavity by this uh, dispersive coupling. So you apply a tone at one resonance, the resonance frequency and you keep it up and a different tone, and it takes the vacuum and splits it in half. Then you have to do some stuff to split those and split those. And <laughs> it's, uh, and then magic happens. <laughs> but that's roughly, you know, roughly. And Bob had a question. I did. I wanted to go back, please, to the technology itself. Yeah. To make sure I uh, understood. Uh, is it something very special to Yale? There? So adding the cavity gains you much longer T2. Yeah. Yes. A factor of 10 to the 3 T2. And it enables better control by means of light. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, much reduction of crosstalk. So if you have a 2D circuit and you're trying to send in with thousands of wires to reach the interior, you pass a lot of uh, stuff on the way in and the signal uh, corrupts uh, more than just the thing you were trying to control. Whereas if it's a coax plug into the side of a 3D cavity, it's not talking to anybody else. Now, people immediately say, oh, you couldn't possibly build a large-scale computer with centimeter-scale cavities. And uh, our response is, well, you can buy gill fridges with a cubic meter of coal. And in a cubic meter, there's a million cubic centimeters. And if you run out of space there, it's a quality problem. <laughs> um, can you talk about what the fidelity of doing operations in this subspace that you've outlined here is? Uh, Sure, so the one, the numbers I know best are uh, for this code, this uh, binomial code that we invented uh, together with an undergraduate uh, a few years ago. 
and uh, Liang, Lu Yang's son, who was a postdoc with Rob Sholkoff in our group, is now has a group in Tsinghua. He has uh, uh, picked this up and done uh, gate, uh, so done um, logical operations. The logical operations are not so trivial. Suppose I want to do a bit flip. I have to turn two into zero plus four. That's not a trivial uh, operation. Uh, that can be done with about uh, 98, 98 and a half percent, I forget the exact number, fidelity. Um, and uh, the, the, the randomized benchmarking is in the paper. And the, um, the, the dominant source of errors in all of these cavity manipulations is the ancilla transmod that we have to use. We'd love to just use the cavity. It has a much longer lifetime. Uh, but it's a harmonic oscillator. And when you have a harmonic oscillator, the only thing you can make is you can displace the vacuum and make a coherent state. You've got to have something anharmonic. And therefore, you have to have this uh, transmon and so on, and live with the fact that the controller is much worse than the thing you're trying to control. But there are some tricks for dealing with that, which we're gradually developing and uh, making the thing tolerant of some of those faults. So high, high 90, I you know, um, sort of 2% infidelity is sort of difficult. And is that infidelity important? for error corrections or doing things? Yes. Um, so, uh, it turns out that error correction, or more precisely, fault tolerance, which is uh, error correction with an imperfect corrector, um, uh, is incredibly high. And even 1% infidelities can be fatal. It's just really hard. So, uh, you know, improving all of these metrics is very, very important. Okay. Any more questions? If not, let's Thank you.